Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can I bring the meeting to order? John, could I have apologies on order of business? Yes, apologies, Chair, from Councillors Coventry, Boyce and Beatty, and the order of business as published on the agenda. Thank you. Are there any declarations of interest? Okay, item four is local government benchmarking. Kenneth, is that you? Yeah. Um, thank you, um, Chair. The purpose of, of this report is to update members on the local government benchmarking um, framework and to present an overview of the Council's performance against the benchmarking indicators. Now, um, I suppose the first thing to say is that the figures in this report all relate to the year 2012-13, so the, the figures are a year old. The, um, this is partly because some of the figures, particularly financial ones, take some time to generate, but it's certainly the intention that in future years these figures will be available for um, councils by around about October time. So towards the end of this year, we should be able to report on the position for 1314. Um, this is the, the second year of the local government benchmarking framework. Of course, <clears throat> this has largely um, replaced the previous statutory um, uh, performance indicators and their measures, which are taken across all 32 um, Scottish Councils, total of 55 indicators. Um, only 54 of them apply to um, uh, Midlothian because we have no museum service. Um, and there's a lot of detail set out about performance on the uh, Improvement Service website for each council and also comparative information. And you see on the first page there the eight um, categories um, of service for which there is uh, information published. And broadly speaking, um, I divide these into what you might call traditional performance indicators about service, financial performance um, uh, indicators, of which you'll see there's quite uh, a number, and also some um, customer satisfaction measures. Now, these are taken from the biannual Scottish Household Survey, so we'll only see them every second um, year. I mean, I, I think it's, it's interesting to note, and, and just in terms of the um, the overall performance of Midlothian, which is set out in the top of page two of the report, page four of the agenda. Half our, half, for half of the indicators, we're in the top um, quartile, and for half of the indicators, we're, we're in the top half, sorry, and for half we're in, in, in the bottom half. So in that sense, it's what you might call um, overall an average performance in Scottish terms, which isn't something that in itself brings me um, particular satisfaction. I think if you go underneath that, and when I was talking about you know, performance measures, financial performance measures and satisfaction measures, in terms of performance measures, a lot of them um, are, are pretty high. In terms of financial performance, it's very mixed. In terms of the, 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 the indicators measured by the biannual Scottish Household Survey, um, seven of the eight are actually in the lower um, half. So there's just an interesting um, question there as to why the satisfaction indicators generally should do less well than um, the others. And there are summary tables attached to the report um, showing the indicators in the top and bottom um, quartiles and a full breakdown of the um, Midlothian um, results um, with the Scottish averages in Appendix 2. Just turning to Appendix 1 first, this is page <clears throat> seven of your agenda, um, we have those in the, um, in the top quartile. I think that um, a few interesting things to note here. I mean, at the bottom, the percentage of the Council's housing stock meeting the Scottish Housing Quality Standard. I mean, that's um, a result that comes about from you know, a long period um, of investment in housing, something which has been a priority um, for this Council. Uh, just above that, you'll notice the sickness absence days per employee. I mean, that's something that we get quite exercised about in the Council, and rightly so. And yet we are, in fact, as, as things stand in the top um, quartile. Um, and I think, if I, uh, just looking above that again, uh, the percentage of pupils from deprived areas gaining five-plus awards at level six, that's a great result to be in the top quartile. But I think that I'd withhold judgment as to whether that's likely to be sustained given the fact that our wider educational performance is still not as good as we would wish it to be. In terms of um, a couple of cost indicators here, you'll notice towards the top of that page, gross cost of waste disposal per premise 
um, a net cost of disposal per premise. You know, we're in the top quartile, but the, the, the thing that goes with that is in terms of collection costs, um, we're in the bottom quartile. And really, the, 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 these two sit as opposites for quite good reason. That is because we do a high degree of separation at curbside, our costs of collection are high, but it means that our subsequent costs of disposal are relatively low. If you turn over the page, we then have um, those in the bottom quartile. Um, just a couple I'd want to comment on. The first one about the percentage of income due from council tax. I think we need to focus on that and, and drive up performance. I don't think there's any um, long-term sustained reason why we should be in the bottom quartile for that. Um, neither our demographics nor our, um, our position in relation to deprivation would suggest that, that uh, there's any reason why that should be the case. Um, at the bottom of the next page, we have the proportion of pupils entering positive destinations. We are, in fact, the most improved authority in Scotland over the last five years, and yet we're still um, in the bottom quartile, so a lot more to do there. I suppose the, the, the point there is that whilst at one stage we were 10 percent behind the average, we're now just um, 1 or 2 percent behind the average, so we are making progress. Um, and over the page, you'll see the educational attainment results, which show we still um, have significant work to do there. Um, there's a lot of information in the, in the report, Chair. I'm happy to try and deal with any questions that colleagues may have, councillors may have. Thank you. Comments, questions? Brian? Yeah, there's a lot can be said with statistics. Eh? And a lot of times we're, we're seeing many reports uh, coming to this uh, uh, chamber with uh, many uh, uh, statistics and benchmark uh, uh, kind of uh, figures put on it. As we understand uh, the whole concept of these statistics and to make sure they're not skewed to make things look favourable or unfavourable, you know, uh, uh, a, a false impression. We see waste services in here, or waste disposal, in both top and quarter uh, quartiles within this uh, kind of, uh, report, uh, and uh, with different parts of waste, obviously. You know, and there's a lot of statistics uh, I've been learning about. Uh, whether it's best value kind of statistics, customer satisfaction statistics, value for money statistics, uh, there's all different types of statistics. And benchmarking has been reorganised, upgraded uh, recently, uh, um, and the, the new dashboard is out there uh, that is, that's available, I think, for all members now you know, to, to, to access. And I've had my, my training on it from the improvement services. And uh, I know it's the report's got Colin Anderson's name on it, uh, but I was really thinking about who to report back to this uh, about my uh, involvement in these uh, statistics uh, uh, awareness uh, reason that I've, I've received as, as a councillor. Um, and just to get a name of an officer, basically, just to discuss this with, because I think this is something, this access to these statistics should be rolled out. Now, when we've taken our statistics, we, we, we can take it on some authorities. You know, we can take it. You know, we can we can benchmark against our, our current uh, uh, areas where we do benchmark on, on certain things. So, some of the statistics can be skewed because of the Scottish average. There's a lot of difference between the uh, city centre of Glasgow and the Shetland Islands in statistics when you start looking at the Scottish averages. But I think you know, more so, we should be looking at our our best of uh, uh, similar local authorities that we that's, that I think that's a more relevant kind of statistic to look at uh, rather than the, uh, the Scottish averages uh, on, on many occasions uh, for a lot of the services that we are delivering in this authority. Um, so just, just a, a name of somebody I can follow up with uh, and uh, have further discussions on uh, and to uh, liaise with uh, making the, the benchmark and dashboard available to a lot more uh, elected members. Thanks. Um, thank you, Chair. I mean, I think in the first instance, if you could speak to Myra Forsyth, who's sitting at the, at, at the back over there, that'd be the, the, the best um, uh, initial source. Just in terms of um, comparisons, I mean, on, on page two of the report, it talks about family groups, and we've always, um, particularly in education, made comparisons with similar authorities. I rec recall, you know, Fife, South Lanarkshire, Clankmanonshire, East Lothian were the ones that were um, were grouped. I mean, there's still work being done in the family groups because um, in terms of um, the benchmarks, there's been an initial division um, into four family groups simply based on um, uh, index of multiple deprivation, um, relative deprivation. Now, in that regard, Midlothian lies 16th in Scotland. If we say that the, 
The least deprived is first, we lie 16th. So that puts us at the bottom of the, the, the second comparator group in with places like Paracolio, Perth and Kinross, Borders, Argyll and Butte. And I'm not sure how relevant these are. And I think your more general point about statistics is that there's, there's facts in here, but they're all subject to interpretation. It's about how we use them. It's about how we use them to um, drive performance, to compare with um, um, relevant others. So the facts in themselves aren't necessarily um, the key thing because there are, there are areas where we, we may choose to spend more money and therefore our costs look high. Equally areas where we have chosen to withdraw um, um, resources, so particularly in the financial indicators, I think they all come with that kind of health warning. But for example, we know that positive destinations is one of the key um, priorities for this, um, for this council. We know we've made a lot of improvement over five years, but what these figures show is that we've still got a long way to go. And I think it can be useful in terms of you know, that sort of information, but I agree that the interpretation is everything. Yeah. Thanks, Derek. Um, <clears throat> just following on from what Brian was saying, I think the statistics uh, are quite difficult to interpret looking at them just in the, the, the present state. For example, the net cost of street cleaning. Now, if that's high, does that mean we have good uh, clean streets or does it mean we have inefficient uh, street sweepers? Um, you need to see that, I think, in context of the, the, the quality of what we're getting for each of these. A couple of points. Um, one, I noticed, uh, I was really pleased to see that the percentage of pupils from deprived areas uh, were improved uh, in, in that area, uh, getting uh, five plus awards. But elsewhere, it seems on page eight uh, at the top, it says the percentage of pupils, presumably this is across the whole of the county, we seem to have uh, be deteriorating there. So I'm not quite sure what, what's happening in that. Um, one question I'd like to ask, though, is uh, on, page, on page 8, it's got corporate and democratic core costs per 1,000 population. The 11 to 12 figure is about 30, just under 35,000, then it goes up to 48,000, um, well above the benchmark, uh, the Scottish average, but we've moved from 20 to 28. Now, what's, what does that mean, first of all, and secondly, what's good and what's bad? Um, Chair, dealing with these in turn, um, firstly on um, street cleaning, if you turn to um, page 14 of the agenda, that's 12, page 12 of the report, um, you'll see, um, as you pointed out, in terms of net costs of street cleaning, um, our position is fifth, we're in the top quartile, therefore our that's saying our costs are, relatively speaking, low. Um, in terms of the street cleanliness score, which is the best measure, I guess, of um, how successful that is, we're, we're 19, so in, we're in the third quarter. And I guess that maybe that's saying something about um, that if you don't spend a huge amount of money, if your costs are low, then you're, it's, it's difficult to get a very high quality of service. So I think that there is a, a value in looking at the... Um, the financial and the performance indicators um, together. I'm taking all of the provisos um, in my you know, previous response to Councillor um, Possinger and the huge differences between different, um, different councils. I think it just gives one a bit more of, a, of a, a sense of performance in relation to cost if you look at the financial and performance indicators um, together. In terms of education, um, at the top of um, page 8, as you, as, as you point out, um, you know, there is a historic issue with um, attainment um, in this authority. We've tended to um, be a relatively um, low performer over um, a long period. Um, from my perspective, I, I suppose in the last um, year or so, particularly with the appointment of Peter McNaughton to Head of Education, um, we've seen a new focus on really driving attainment and, 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 and getting schools to um, be accountable, more accountable for that. Um, these figures, of course, predate that. They're the figures to the end of, of March. But it's also true that you know, education figures, particularly in a small authority, can 
vary up and down a bit on an annual basis just because of the particular you know, strength of the cohort going, going through. The numbers are relatively um, low. And that's why I said my introduction when I expressed my you know, great pleasure in, in terms of the percentage of pupils from deprived areas gaining five plus at level six being in the top quartile. That's a great result. But I personally feel that, that as yet, um, our performance across education doesn't mean that I have a huge amount of competence that will sustain that. So we do see that kind of variation um, year on year in terms of education indicators. The important thing is that we see a trend um, of improvement over a longer period. Now, members of this committee, we've had previous discussions about you know, the excellent reports we get in terms of our um, nursery provision, generally good reports we get in terms of our, our schools. So, um, and of course, we're also focusing in early years to, uh, on early years to a substantial degree. So these should be the building blocks of longer-term improvements in education. But it's going to take quite some time um, to work through. But I do think it's very important in terms of maximizing opportunities for people in our communities that we, we give it that, that long-term drive and focus. And sorry, there was one other issue, which is about corporate and democratic core. I mean, essentially, this is about um, the costs of functions like secretariat and administrative functions within the organization. Um, I suppose most of us would like to see that being relatively low, because what we'd want to ensure is that, the, um, to the greatest possible extent, our resources being expended in frontline services and not in back office. Um, if you'd like a more detailed breakdown of what exactly that comprises, we can certainly provide that. Alec. Just <coughs> briefly, Kenneth, it's on page 7 at the top of the indicators. It's, uh, it's the home care costs, the first, the first two brackets. But it relates to people 65 and over. Uh, now, I accept on the balance of probability that most people who receive home care will be over the age of 65, but the, I know there's people in my constituency who are under the age of 65 who also receive home care. Is there a difference by they're not included in this section, or, or should they, they be included in a separate section? Um, thank you, Chair. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, these, these indicators were, um, certainly the indicators relate to social work, um, were devised over the last number of years by um, you know, the chief social work officers working together, working out the appropriate indicators. So that information may be available elsewhere in terms of those that aren't over 65, but it's certainly not included among, anywhere amongst the benchmark figures. Okay, Jim? No, I just, just coming back on the issue that um, Ian raised, the, the, the corporate and democratic costs. I think I would certainly like to see um, a breakdown of that because I would have thought that given the changes that we've made in terms of the removing you know, tiers of management, we've, we've cut down our, um, the directorate, etc., um, that I would have expected between the end of 2012 and, and coming up to the, to the end of last year, we would have seen decreases where we've, we, we've actually seen a, well, a, only about 40 odd percent increase between 2011 and 12. Um, at then a slight decrease, but it's still 10,000 per 1,000 population more than it was. Uh, so it's a, you know, a third more than it was um, uh, back then, at a time where I would have expected to have seen a reduction. I realise that there will, within that, probably be an element of the cost of so implementing the changes we've made, uh, but I just, I just didn't see it. I, I can't understand why that upward uh, thrust is so significant. Yeah, thank you, um, Chair. I mean, that's one of a number of indicators which I must say puzzles me um, somewhat because obviously as an authority we, we generate all the data, we feed it into the system and, and the, uh, the information comes back because I would expect that to um, uh, be coming down over time as well because we are, um, in terms of the um, changes in management, other changes taking costs out of the um, out of the back office. I think that's why, I mean, it would be useful, and I'll, I'll perhaps circulate it to the committee generally, the, the, um, the, what the definition is there, what the figures have been 
in the last number of years and, and, and how that's um, how that's calculated. I think that's all information we can um, we can get hold of. But, I mean, that's one, and there are others as well. If you look at some of the financial indicators, where the differences from one year to the next seem to suggest that um, you know the, the, the calculation is something which you know perhaps still needs refinement or certainly needs more explanation. Yeah. <clears throat> I think perhaps Brian should have hit on uh, trying to understand some of the figures in that, uh, um, and it would be helpful, Kenneth, if you could circulate that, that, that information. But if you look, for example, on page 9, uh, it's one of the ones that baffles me, is the cost of maintenance per kilometre of road, uh, um, where we went from um, £11,012 to £6,487 uh, um, uh, um, to £14,000. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, last year. I can only take it that, that, that and I don't know, I probably need to be Ricky here, and I can it's just in Southern for him, and it's not his speciality road, but I can only assume that stuff like that is, for example, the cost of Lugton Bray and the slip at, 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 at Rosling Glen being included in the, 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 these figures, because the, this council has, o over the years, invested about a million pound in addition. Uh, um, and that's continued through the new administration that there's been that further investment in, in, into the road. So it's quite difficult to see um, because just, without searching for the figure, I think the figure for, for the year beforehand was something like £9,000 per, per, per square metre. Uh, and, and that's sort of gone up and down. So it kind of baffles you because you know fine well that the council hasn't came in and says, well, we're, we're going to invest uh, um, 150% of an increase in cash uh, and, and your roads this, th th this year. So it's combining that, and it's actually that it says here the indicators are included in the LGBF family group pilot to, to draw down to figure out how, how we work out this information. And it, it just shows that using statistics sometimes isn't giving us a clear, a, a, a clear, a, a clear picture of what we are spending. And, and I think, sort of, can't mind you, as was making the point, you know. Because you get to the top of the table for, for the cost of street sweeping, does it make it a better service? No, it doesn't. It actually makes it a, a, a worse service where uh, uh, um, you're only getting for what, what you pay for. So the tables are somewhat misleading to, the, to, 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 to not just yourselves, but to the public, who, when you're showing well, for example, we're doing really well with, with, with a service. We're at the top of the league for local authorities, and folk are looking at it and going, well, lad, the service is rubbish, but it still doesn't matter. What's point new is value per, per, per pound. We should be, be getting a better service. might not be what the, the folk think we should be spending it on, uh, um, but it, is quite, it, it can be quite misleading. Kenneth? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 that's, um, the one you pick out there, Chair, is perhaps the most stark example, because that's puzzled um, all of us. Um, to degree, and that's actually why that's uh, one of the particular areas of focus that officers are, uh, you know, are, are, are looking at these uh, indicators across Scotland coming together, because you know, people don't expect to see that kind of um, variance. Now, the historic issue with statutory performance indicators was always the doubt that everybody was measuring it exactly the, the same way. Um, now, um, that doubt has to remain when there is that kind of um, variation, and I suppose that the um, you know, the, benchmark, the benchmarking work is still in some ways at a relatively um, early stage, but I think it's the financial indicators we have to um, treat with the, the greatest degree of scepticism perhaps because you know, just the kind of variation we're seeing undermines potentially the value of the, the, of, of the information presented. Yeah, because I'm just about to contradict myself because I'm just looking at the year here, so it can't even be the lugged and brief figures that are coming into this because therefore for, for the last financial year. So, so it's quite hard to understand when you see variations like that when everybody sitting around this table knows that there hasn't been a huge cut one year and then a huge increase the, 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 the next year. So it's hard to understand how uh, um, it can vary in such a, a, a wild manner. However, any other questions for, for Kenneth on this paper? Okay. Just a brief comment. I mean, sometimes these statistics are not the end of it. You know, it's just the start of it. You know, they're providing questions for us. You know, they're not providing answers. Right? And uh, the, 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 the process, you know, if people are preparing reports on because of the benchmark and statistic, you know, anybody can draw down a different benchmark statistic, you know, to, to, to counteract it. I mean, statistics, Dan Larry's and statistics is the, the kind of quotation, you know, that's often used. You know, you, you can always get a contrary statistic. Yeah, but, it, you know, if it's showing trends, you know, if, if we were spending all this money on street lighting, recently, you know, uh, replacement columns, it's a spend to save thing, 
Well, why should that skew our statistics? Because we've got a 25-year guaranteed LED uh, light head that's a lot cheaper to run, you know. But you have to have this kind of saving. And the really only maybe examples was uh, new build housing. You know, people are, and levels of satisfaction could be based on levels of expectation. You know, no, no, no actual proper satisfaction, but you know, they deemed it was going to be a, you know, a state-of-art uh, leisure centre. You know, when they walked into it. You know, so the levels of expectations is based on the levels of satisfaction as well. So there's a lot of ways to. to uh, a tinker way or excuse the statistics. Um, th 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 that's absolutely right. What I would say, um, take that point about the uh, customer satisfaction st statistics, there's still a lot to be done in relation to the financial ones, but a lot of the performance ones are, are pretty robust in terms of you know, educational performance, in terms of things like recycling. So the, 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 are, the performance indicators are the ones which are probably the most important in this report, and the other ones perhaps provide some context, um, but do require further refinement. Okay. With that, can we agree to note the recommendations in section 5 of the report? Okay. Thank you. Can we move on to uh, item 5, 5A, Midlothian Council? Kenneth? <coughs> yes, thank you, Chair. I mean, this is the annual performance report for 2013 um, 14. Again, a lot of information, but I, I'll, I'll be brief in my, um, my introduction. But what I, I, I would say um, is that I do think that these, you know, the first you know, half dozen pages or so are um, useful reading in terms, it's probably the closest we have to a, a, an overview of, you know, Midlothian um, Council and performance for 2013-14. Um, I think in many ways this is um, a broadly positive report. It's set out um, over the five themes of the single Midlothian plan. And um, it demonstrates progress um, in a number of areas in terms of integration, in terms of reductions in antisocial behaviour, some of the innovative and very positive work being done in children's services in relation to early years, um, much needed improvements in education and children's services, progress in terms of support to business, waste, housing and some other areas. And it's right that we um, identify where things are, are, are going well and celebrate that success. It also points out the challenges, particularly in the last couple of pages of the, um, the introduction to the report. And um, you know, every time we have one of these meetings, Chair, I, I talk about the, the challenges, you know, welfare reform, the, the very constrained funding position, and uh, the challenges we have with demographics, the absolute need for you know, fundamental transformation across a number of our service areas, health and social care integration, and, and the sheer scale of that in terms of a change to how we, uh, how we operate as a council. And as I've said earlier on in relation to the previous report, on, ongoing challenges in terms of um, performance in education, in terms of positive destinations. Um, and I suppose the stark fact is that we still need to improve outcomes for our communities, and we need to do that at lower cost. Um, and that will um, require very challenging um, decisions um, um, by this council um, in the coming um, months and years. So there is a lot of uh, detail there, as I say. There are the various um, performance indicators and the actions from the middle of the single plan set out in the latter um, pages of the report. Happy to take any questions or if members, um, or simply to point out that members will this afternoon have some of the, the officers that are able to deal with the, the details on education and social work specifically. Thanks, Kenneth. Uh, as you heard the Chief Executive saying, we will have each of the directors and heads of services throughout the day. It's sometimes more difficult we're having a broken meeting that, that, that some members might have questions on this where the experts are not actually here to answer them. But for the moment, is there anybody with any pressing questions that would like to ask Kenneth? Okay, with that, could we move on to item 5B? And that is commercial operation. I gather Justin, have you? Good morning. I'm going to talk about commercial operations annual performance reports for 2013-14. Uh, waste services, there's tenders have been received to allow the council to offer food waste collection to trade customers. This is a result of legislation uh, that came into effect in January this year, and fourth resources have been appointed. Work is being undertaken to promote recycling generally, and 
and this is initially in the recycling centres, and this is through Zero Waste Scotland, and they have four staff there at present for a short period of time. Um, the review of the street cleaning um, is ongoing and develop proposals for consideration. And as you're aware, the blue bin uplay lift has been coordinated with the street sweeping routes. Um, the land and countryside and the waste management team have met to discuss the criteria for the location of bins and ensure that the land and countryside section are involved in the process. And the gully motors have not been included um, in this review because they deal heavily with the repairs and blockages and therefore work with the drainage crews from road section and also the lorries are demountable and they're heavily involved in snow clearing and gritting in the winter months so that the link is with the, the road services. Um, item two is delivery of food and residual waste treatment facilities. The ALUNA, ALUNA commenced the construction of the food waste facilities at Miller Hill. And they're on site and should complete in December 2015. Network Rail is progressing the construction of the access road bridge to the site and they're working with our road services who are going to be involved in the road construction. Um, on receipt of the, the final investigation work, um, two bidders for residual waste treatment are, are submitting their final tenders. This is ongoing and there's discussions with SEPA as well on, on the extraction on the trammel belts and seeing what we have to implement there. The hope is that we can use magnets only to reduce our costs. Uh, item three, the road network. Um, we've uh, secured external funding um, to undertake the LED light uh, initial program and there's been 915 lanterns changed. This equates to 5.13% of the existing lighting stock, and this reduces our carbon emissions by 0.1 of a tonne. Uh, the revenue savings from this are about 11,500 for the lanterns, and obviously there's an ongoing cost saving because the light bulbs don't need changed for 20 years. Um, and the next phase is to change 400 lights again this year, and 520 lights within the town center, uh, town centers via Salix funding. Um, as you're aware, the Lugton Bray opened at the end of March, um, and the roads capital program has been completed successfully, and the survey re results show a slight improvement in the Midlothian road network. Um, there's a service level agreement in place to allow one traffic ward warden to operate in Midlothian, and in fact, this is now going to be over two years at a reduced rate, so it's 24,000 for the two-year period. Uh, land and services, item four. Uh, park quality assessments have taken place, and this has been in 36 parks, and we try to untake at least three improvements. These could be quite small things, from putting in benches, repairing paths, painting fences, to try and do something at all, all these sites. And, and at various, in some areas, we obviously try and secure funding and do something a little bit more dr dramatic. So in Rosewell Park, for instance, financing uh, was got together for 55,000 last year and the works is now completed. Uh, Newton Grange Park, there was 76,000 pounds worth of funding um, sourced last year and work starts in late June and should finish in mid-August with a company called Bendcrete. The Bonnie Rig Skate Park, £165,000 worth of funding is in place and the work is ongoing. That's with a contractor called Freestyle and is due to finish in July. And low in head, a park, there's some park improvements and there's £140,000 worth of funding being secured and the tender will be going out soon to start in late July. Uh, last year we completed work in Bilston Park to the value of 60,000 again through funding and we've worked with the Forestry Commission at the kilns up at the top of Mayfield and created a path network um, and, and that's a sort of unique project. And as you're probably aware, we, we, we secured three green flags for different parks last year and we're aiming to get one for Kings Park and Dalkeith this year. 
Okay. Uh, item 5 is travel and fleet services. We're progressing discussions with the NHS regarding shared service initiative. That's basically providing a bus that we sh share usage with, with the NHS. And the introduction of the ring and go service, um, we've, as a result of the 328 bus service being withdrawn, we had 36 customers in Kuzlan register with us and 21 in Miller Hill and Newton Village and we had 98 users in the first two weeks. I'll, I'll just pause now if, we, if there's any questions. Okay, th thank you. I should maybe perhaps say at the start that Justin Venton, who's our large services manager, is subbing for Ricky Moffat. Uh, um, so if there's any real intricate questions, I'm sure John will try and help him answer them. And if no, um, we'll get Ricky to fire the in hand forward. Ian, did you want to, to come in? Yeah, just briefly, just looking at the emerging challenges, they all seem to centre on uh, issues regarding staffing, and obviously in, a, in a, an environment where we are trying to reduce our costs, this is obviously going to be a, a challenging area. Can you give us a bit more detail on how that's going and whether the, the staff this does refer to reduced morale, and that does concern me? I'd be happy to answer for land and countryside, and then perhaps John could answer for some other sections. Within Land and Countryside, we have agreed seasonal working hours with the staff, and um, looking at the staff survey, there, there is a, a bit of a downturn in staff morale. It didn't look too, too bad and dramatic, and, and you know, so we've, we've moved on with that. So I think there's, there's some realism there as, as well. In terms of the other two specific services listed at the bottom of the page, 69 within the recycling centre the staff reductions have been accommodated well will be accommodated through the voluntary severance scheme and understand a week past Friday there was a meeting regarding school crossing patrol service which seemed to be amicable also in this chamber we received a bit of criticism about our initial communication regarding staff changes we've taken that back on board through the division. So that's a response to the specifics. Would any further I'll try and help? Brian? Yeah, I, th I think we we'll maybe uh, highlight this, this, this little bit before. The last sentence on uh, uh, page 69, proposals are being developed for discussion with the trade unions in relation to lower graded salary, right? It's, it's to the lower graded salary people, you know, it's, we're not actually moving to lower anybody's grades, uh, and uh, I'd like to see that word the inserted in there, uh, as I've maybe previously mentioned. Eh? Um, the street lighting I've already uh, uh, um, mentioned, you know, I mean, it's, it's a great, it's a good, obviously for the carbon footprint, Ian, you know, but it's, it's good for the, the fact that it's going to save money. Uh, and the lights, the lights division uh, will not need as many staff, I suppose, in the future once we get all these uh, lovely guaranteed uh, LED lights up. But uh, the percentage uh, of the, 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 the lamp standards that are getting done, obviously we've targeted the, the rustiest ones first, you know, uh, columns, uh, uh, to replace the, the appropriate heads. And uh, I'm s just the numbers, 915, uh, I, I mean, I was aware of a 400 number for the first round. Uh, and obviously subsequent bids were coming out for other uh, street lights uh, for, uh, and ov obviously uh, hopefully uh, it's a strain to save uh, project that uh, can get done uh, for, for, the, for the throughout Midlothian and, uh, and first I've heard about the Sealex funding for the uh, town centres as well. Obviously in the skate parks we've mentioned before uh, it's community money you know, that's, that's been raised for this, it's no council money but it's b basically been well administered by James Kinch and I've said that before and, uh, and he's helped a lot of them source uh, external funding uh, as well to, uh, uh, to, to do these uh, improvements into the parks. But now, now that the, the works in the parks are deteriorating as, as we're uh, covering up uh, or we're, uh, we're uh, stopping flower beds uh, and particularly noticed uh, Kings Park uh, and Newton Grange Park, uh, the number of flower beds that are getting taken out uh, and just seeded over, grass seeded over. And I just wonder that you know, the, the actual numbers we're actually doing uh, uh, in the parks and that maybe even ward members can get a, an update of uh, uh, their, their own uh, parks and obviously uh, Gorebridge is, uh, is a concern to, to, to myself as well because if we're getting green flags for, for good parks you know are, are we actually uh, cutting our nose off the spite our face you know actually are we deteriorating you know the, 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 the actual uh, appearance of these parks 
and uh, Newton Grange uh, uh, at the War Memorial, the flower beds around it are actually brilliant. And, and we've, we've had the awards for the best kept War Memorial uh, three of the last four years. Yeah? Rosalind pinched it last year, that award, but you know, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's coming back. Yeah? But you know, it's just, uh, uh, just if we could get Mayor. And I think members would like, uh, and I don't know if I speak for everybody, but the actual practicalities of when they're actually taking th these uh, uh, cost reduction measures you know, into place, the actual practicalities of them actually getting done. You know, it'd be good you know, to get information on that at the time. Thanks for that, Brian. Yeah, I think it'll be a, a long time before we'll see a reduction in the staff on the, the, the street lighting. Uh, um, I would think the numbers we have done won't even be 0.01% of our uh, total street, street lighting. I think what would actually be helpful to us, and, and we had some discussion before, was if we could get sent doing some of the details of uh, uh, how many lights have been done, how many have still to be done. There was some discussion um, at a, a, a previous meeting on the savings that were being made, and would it be possible to invest even further in LED street lighting to try and make further savings and use the, 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 the savings to borrow capital to, to fast track that, uh, uh, um, that operation? Uh, because at one time it seemed like we would save more over the lifetime uh, um, by doing nearly all street lines, putting them LED. Um, however, when the figures were broken down, it was less, it was less sure whether or not that was a factor. And, and I'm aware that um, Ricky is not here to answer these questions in depth, so it might be worth getting some questions, but I'm sure Justin can answer any of the questions. John? Yeah. In terms of the LED lighting, you're right, as an action on us, and having the 900-odd units gives us a good size to come forward with a case study and options going forward. So that's in the work plan. That will come forward after the recess. I might but Justin ask you any specific landscape and countryside questions? I'd be happy to provide an update on the flower bed list and, and what changes we've made. But yeah, the further cut, 20%, has affected just about everywhere this year. Chair, it's really, <coughs> I, I don't think it's uh, the Council, well, I know the Council's not delivering us, but it's in Europe round about the, the development of the border railway between the Cockatoo and Newton village uh, and the alignment of the road from Sheriff Hall, which uh, comes out of the same roundabout. Now, it seems, it seems to me that the Hago Street pretty regular. The roundabout's really been completed for more than a month, and yet it's still surrounded by cones. There are temporary traffic lights, which are there all the time, Sometimes they're at constant green, other time, the other day I drove through them at red, then back to green. It just seems to be taking forever to complete this road, because I, I think in the long term there might be an argument, John, again, on, on public transport, because if you, I've, when I've walked along the road, there's provisions for uh, bus stops, laybys for bus stops, etc., all part of the new development is going to take place, but there might be an argument for a bus, maybe once an hour, going round that way, round by the round and back up with Dander Hall, which would give a bus service to Newton Village in that area. But until this roundabout is completed, eh, eh, I, I don't think that's feasible. It just seems to be taking forever. Well, then, all the brickworks are done in the roundabout, and eh, it just seems to be taking forever for, for, for it to clear it, eh, because there are cones here permanently all the time. OK, I can liaise with colleagues and roads and also network rail and BAM and see if we can push it on. So I'll take that. And link back in with Ricky and hopefully see a resolution. Okay. The reason I'm raising it, because yesterday we, had, we were uh, we approached uh, me and Margo uh, by Jim Glass of the Cocky Two, as you probably are aware, he's, uh, he's, he's, it's a bugbear to him, like. But he's right in the sense that it's taken forever to complete this round of being asked. That's just why I'm raising it today, John. OK. Brian? Just, just a bit follow up on the flower beds, eh? You mentioned the figure of the 20 percent, you know, and we understand that sort of budget-wise. Um, uh, but are you trying to work that 20 percent per public park, or is it 20 percent overall? Is there any non-park uh, flower beds getting taken out at, at, at this uh, uh, juncture? And uh, uh, basically, that's, that's the sort of criteria. I mean, and it's, it's good to get the information uh, award member-wise uh, per, per park. The, the changes are right across the authority. So um, last year we made 
the reductions, we obviously picked the beds that were most hidden away, the least viewable by the public, least in the public eye, not in the parks. But this, this year, we haven't had that to fall back on, so it has affected the, the smaller villages, it has affected the parks um, right across the board. So there's, there's just about no area that's not affected. So Dalkeith Town Centre is affected, Kings Park and Dalkeith is affected. We know we've turfed over about 80 square metres of the beds there and sewing out. So e e each area has, has been affected and, the, and, and, and any flower beds still left in obscure locations have definitely gone. And we've had a little bit of involvement from a couple of communities like Temple, um, uh, where they, they've taken, they're taken on some of the maintenance. So that produces the saving without having to get rid of the flower beds. But yes, I can provide a list per ward showing you what's, what's gone. Uh, and, and as you say, there's four beds gone in Newton Grange Park and, and a couple of others with more sh shrub, shrubs in them. And, and I, I know there's been a bit of s stuff on Facebook about that. Are there any other questions? I, I think it may be, um, if we want to end on a positive note, I think it's quite right uh, um, that Brian raises the fact that, 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 that there is a lot of good work being done by, by, by staff. And rather as going to just a one staff member, I think that we need to talk about the health department. If you look at kind of parts and, and, and places like the skate parts, pathways and stuff like that, there's a lot of external funding being drawn into this council and a lot of work being done. Um, across the council with different bodies, voluntary groups, local councillors, community groups uh, 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 and the like. Uh, and I think uh, um, we want to maybe finish this on congratulating them and thanking them for all their hard work and hopefully they'll be, 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 be recognised for, 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 for that type of initiative because it is important at this time when finances are becoming more and more tight that the council try to get money for every different source of it with wherever possible. So I, I think I would like to, to, to end this on that, that note. So if you could take that back just into your guys and John to the rest of the guys that are, that are involved in this. With that, can we agree to, to, to note this uh, uh, paper? Okay. Thank you. Um, move on to item 5B2, and that's customer services. Kevin, I take it. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in terms of the performance report for customer services over 1314, the customer services strategy which formed one of the transformational strands within the financial strategy was previously submitted to Council. That's been uh, producing a draft customer service strategy at this time that reflects on how we will deliver services to customers and communities across Midlothian, understanding and profiling those in terms of how we do that in the future, uh, in terms of uh, channel shift and delivery into communities. As is indicated there, a pilot hub has been agreed for the Mayfield area as one of our identified areas of deprivation, uh, and that's currently being uh, led through a project team to establish the learning for that, which, of course, we will report back in due course from the outcomes of that exercise. In terms of maximising revenues collections, collection levels on council tax remain down on the year, as was referenced earlier by the Chief. Uh, certainly our collection level was at 93.5 per cent this year in comparison to 94 per cent last year, albeit the value of uh, collection was increased, but that reflects the increased housing stock across a range of tenures from the, the new builds across Midlothian in recent years. In wealth, in the rent arrears trend has uh, similarly was expected to, to increase across the year, and indeed it did uh, until the year end where there were significant efforts by staff uh, in terms of maximising income to households and the eligibility for discretionary housing payments. And uh, we ended the year at 7.53%, which was a significant effort given we projected 10% being the, the rent arrears uh, level for the year end. Other aspects of welfare reform, crisis grants and community care grants were administered through the revenues team by the Council as part of welfare reform changes. Uh, clearly, clearly, we continue to undertake mitigation action uh, across the year and in anticipation of uh, the universal credit coming into place at 2016. Crisis grants and community care grants uh, continue to be our priority task in revenues, and certainly that's reflected in the detail that's been provided to members in terms of processing uh, levels, which have increased from 20 days to 23 days for benefit claims, uh, because welfare um, 
care grants and crisis grants are dealt with within the same day at the expense of processing. In terms of technology and information management, not within my direct remit, but I would uh, report back that the Digital Strategy Group are implementing the uh, strategy, which has similarly been reported separately to Council, and uh, ICT staffing and establishment uh, uh, review has been halted relative to the wider integrated service support, uh, which is taking place. Structural changes within the Council, as has again have been referenced earlier, will take time to implement and will in turn have implications for IT services and staff uh, in addressing and aligning to those services. The Information Commissioner audit uh, has been concluded and the reports and findings from that have been updated in terms of the Information Commissioner's website and the revised status to our own. Members will be familiar with the PSN compliance requirements which uh, the Council were obliged to uh, rule out. Again, there was significant effort from IT colleagues in making sure that that uh, compliance was met, and indeed it has, and we report back that the corporate network into schools is now coming to an end. IT services also provide a key role in the corporate document management, sorry, management project, which is another key facilitator in the EWIN project. Uh, which members will be aware of. In terms of emerging challenges, through the customer services strategy, we have two phases. Uh, as I've indicated, we're currently, uh, through the draft strategy, mapping out the customer profile so that we're understanding uh, where our customers are in terms of uh, the demands that are made across services and how uh, the services can be accessed in those areas and the requirements that there are for council services generally. And uh, in terms of uh, how we address that, which is the channel shift element, which will be delivered in phase two, uh, which is looking at the telephony, uh, the IT, and again, appropriate means of channel shift, uh, because it won't be that there is a solution for all and any client group particularly. So that's an area that is still work in progress in the coming year. Clearly, as we've referenced earlier, we uh, continue to make efforts to maximise revenues collection, and that will be a focus for us going into the, into the new financial year. Uh, and certainly, we're going to be subject to Audit Scotland uh, review into June uh, in terms of a follow-up report from a previous report, which was carried out by Audit Scotland in 2011, and that will come through either Audit Committee or this in due course once that uh, piece of work is concluded. As is indicated in the narrative, there are additional demands with pre-court action requirements for <coughs> recovery of rents and council tax, which is added to the workload, but has not significantly impacted on the detail that's provided with uh, the transaction turnaround uh, submitted to members today. Welfare reform, as we've indicated earlier, we continue our mitigation actions about providing advice, guidance and support to affected individuals and groups and uh, the new requirement which went live from 1st of April in terms of crisis grants and community care grants has been successfully achieved and has been subject to a separate audit report which will come forward to audit committee in June. Happy to pause for any questions, Chair. Thank you, Kevin. Any questions, comments? Brian. Uh, <coughs> customer services strategy is, uh, I'm finding many, many questions uh, on it just now, you know, as, I mean, just what is the strategy? Um, we're, we're losing Janet Court, yeah, uh, in, in the in the, in the uh, near future, and the, we've got a hub project uh, for for uh, uh, mentioned for Mayfield. Um, just a bit more, I was look, I'm looking for a bit more information on this. Um, what size is this hub project? You know, what's the locality of it? You know, what what uh, what's the the resources uh, implications for having this hub project? Uh, what's the criteria for Mayfield? Um, are, are, we, are we going to go in the future with a, 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 a Dalkeith kind of hub, which is obviously the central kind of market town for the Holy Midlothian, or, or are we talking about various uh, uh, franchises uh, out, out, out with uh, Dalkeith uh, in, in the future, uh, or are we we're talking about just relocating it because most of the, the messages is, and the stuff is coming in by the telephone, you know, uh, inquiries and email uh, kind of stuff that can get heard by. Uh, t uh, technology anywhere, or, or are we moving into a, a, a drop-in uh, uh, scenario where people can actually come in to, to a, a hub site with, the, with their, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, 
Um, I mean, this is what councillors get, eh? You know, we get the drop-ins, you know, if it's our own surgeries, but it's, it's, the, it's the customer services uh, heading in that kind of uh, direction at all for any kind of, uh, or is it uh, appointment-based systems or, or what, 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 just a bit more information, please, Kevin, on where are we actually going with this customer care strategy? Certainly. Um, in terms of uh, JANUC, uh, as Councillor Portinger has mentioned, that does feature within the EWIM provisions about rationalising the, uh, the uh, assets, the building uh, of the Council's estate. Uh, and it is the intention, uh, as you indicate, that we take the contact centre service out with uh, JANUC Court and it would be located within Buclew House, which in itself um, would be considered to be a customer services hub. In terms of the uh, current um, footfall, the numbers that we're able to uh, profile at present, uh, most of the services people engage with are ba based within Buclew House through housing, homelessness, revenues. Um, of course, we have the, the library adjacent to that uh, in terms of being able to facilitate uh, more online transactions, particularly from the job centre where people are referred across to ourselves and to the libraries. Uh, so it's trying to uh, provide and contain all those elements in the one location for people to be able to access on a wider scale so that the Clue House itself becomes the customer services hub by default, um, if, if nothing else, uh, in terms of design. The Hub proposals from Mayfield are at a very early stage. We're anticipating four staff from the Customer Services Contact Centre uh, who have that breadth of knowledge and are multi-skilled, clearly, in terms of the uh, contacts that come in through that uh, present avenue uh, to be deployed in Mayfield um, at the library uh, at the outset, certainly because, again, the intention is that we have fixed assets as libraries in our communities already, and it's uh, more accessibility accessibility, sorry, to those services. It's not proposing decentralisation, it's maximising the opportunity for people to access services and our delivery of those services, particularly as we have staff operating much more uh, on a mobile basis, using the kit, as we referenced earlier, with the PSN requirements that were uh, necessary, that staff will be able to touch down in the jargon in these areas uh, and deal with services and, indeed, service users. Um, in terms of looking at Mayfield, that's been based on an analysis of our um, failure demand. Sorry to use the jargon again, but that's where the demand is coming because services are not being delivered right first time. Uh, clearly, we have uh, a lot of uh, footfall into the Mayfield Library because a lot of the early years provision for the PEEP coordinators, the book bugs, the, the vicinity it has to the school. Uh, we equally have uh, staff who are certainly engaged and open in delivering uh, the potential of additional services into Mayfield, uh, which is why, again, we've pinpointed that area. We, we have a building, we have the staff who are engaged, um, it, and it's to take the learning from that, frankly, to see how we would then roll that out across other library facilities, and equally taking the learning we've got from the likes of Last Way, the potential for a new battle, having those assets in the areas, and how we deliver um, ongoing and improved services with the reduced resources that we've referenced earlier. Certainly, as you indicate, in terms of phone and email, uh, and as is detailed in some of the supplementary sheets there, we have increased transactions through there, and it's looking to maximise that through the payments um, for the income uh, being guaranteed to the Council through those avenues as well. We've increased the capacity and looking to make that shift and maximise those opportunities for people. So it's doing more of that, but certainly, as we've referenced, once the uh, project team uh, uh, finalise that strategy, happy to, to pick that up both here or in terms of a, a, a group briefing if necessary with members. Thanks, Kevin. Questions? Joe? Uh, just a, an observation, convener, that uh, it's just as well the Scottish Government, I think, froze the council tax to help the poor people because um, the poorest in our society, because it saw UK government uh, hits at these people that are causing problems for this Midlothian Council. And again, I think it shows that the, the, uh, the welfare reform changes that have still to come are going to have a huge impact. And uh, the bedroom tax, which again mitigated for by the Scottish Government, uh, uh, the Scottish uh, taxpayers' expense, I think that just shows that the, the, uh, the Scottish Government needs all the powers we require to run these uh, benefit systems ourselves to be able to pass back down to the local authorities. It's, um, the, the bedroom tax as well was 
introduced, not by the Tories, but by Gordon Brown, and the Tories just uh, used it as a, a stick for beating the local authorities all over the place because they didn't like local, local authorities. Jim first. Uh, Chair, I, I don't think this is actually the place to, to, to debate that kind of thing. And I noticed that you know, most of the time when, when, when Councillor uh, Wallace comes in is to make these kinds of points at these meetings. I would have thought it would have been better to, to, to be a bit more constructive about what we're actually talking about here and now. But I would also remind them that the Scottish Government, uh, in the desperate event that we actually say yes to, to the proposal that's before us on, on uh, in, in September, us to have the resources to run the benefit system, and there's pre precious little information in anything that I've seen up to now as to how it's got to be able to afford to do that. Can we? Oh, and I, I'm not going to sit and have a tit for tat here on the, the, the yes no referendum, guys. We're here to deal with a paper that, that, that's in front of us today. Ian. Thank you, Derek. Um, I'm just, just want a bit more information on the PSN uh, challenges here. It says uh, further work is required in schools to extend the corporate network and provide access to other business applications. I'd understood that this, this was the change that resulted in us no longer being allowed to access our emails from home, for instance. I, I thought that those restrictions had to be put in place by April and that was the end of it. Are we saying that there's further work to be done here? I'm sorry, Chair, I'm not in a position to give Councillor Baxter an answer to that, but I'll get my colleague Phil Timoney to be able to respond to him later. Joe. Yes, Kendall, I would like to come back on that. I was referring to this paper that's in front of us, and it says the revenues collection. We have a problem with it because of the, the, the benefits that are hitting the poorer people in society. So I'm addressing this paper and not just raising a point, but we do have to raise the points that do cause these problems to the poorer people in society and that have an impact on this council. And this report here is on the annual performance of the officers in dealing with that. Any other questions relevant to the, to, to, to the paper? Brian. Just, just to follow up to what Kevin was saying, I'm, I'm glad we're keeping the, the core you know, at, the, at the capital here uh, in Dalkeith uh, for the, the services, and it's great to see it being uh, uh, accessed from the, the satellite the libraries and the, possibly high schools in the future. And I think that's the way for customer services in the future to, to operate, you know, as much, as much autonomy as possible in the, in the local areas, in the local wards, uh, and, uh, but keeping the, the core services at, where it's, uh, it's beneficial to us all. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for, the, for Kevin? Okay, with that, can we agree you know, the, the, the report? Thank you. Move on to item 5B3 is finance and human resources. Is that yourself, Gary? It is indeed, Chair. Thanks. Um, Chair, the, the paper sets out um, the, 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 the achievements, challenges and actions for, for the year just passed. And really just this morning, I wanted just to, to tease out a, a few for, for committee. Um, in terms of um, achievements, um, they, they, they set across all of the, the services within the team. Um, in terms of financial stewardship, we have uh, the approval of the, the revenue and capital financial strategies through Council earlier um, in, in February, um, and that's a key building block in terms of moving forward our, our overall financial sustainability in light of the, 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 the wider public sector financial environment. Um, as part of that, that financial sustainability, um, we have continued to, to make big, big steps forwards in procurement. Um, if you remember rightly, um, um, in 2010 we were sitting down um, languishing in, in bottom in terms of performance as an organisation, um, and in 2013-14 we saw our, our, our assist capability assessment take us up to, to 60 per cent, um, up amongst the, 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 the top of the pile in terms of Scottish local authorities. Um, through, in conjunction with trade union colleagues, we have brought forward and implemented a, a new health and safety and improvement plan, and we are seeing the, 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 the benefits of that coming through the organisation. Uh, and of course, 12, 13, 14 saw the, the, the future of the, the My Future programme um, after Council had agreed the, the no compulsory redundancy policy, um, and that continues to, to support us in, in maximising the use of our workforce um, and, and gaining flexibility as we, as we go through a period of downsizing. 
Um, and all of that is linked to, to delivery of financial sustainability and, and the transformation programme that sits behind that um, and, and really making sustainable changes in the way we deliver services, focusing limited resources on delivering the Council's key outcomes. Um, we have seen the, the transformation strategy um, aligned to the single Midlothian plan and he's moved to Council later this month. We will see the, the, the latest iteration of the, the transformation strategy coming through. Um, a key part um, within my area, um, as we flowed through from the, the changes at head of service level, is the implementation of phase one of the integrated service support review, which brings forward management structure for proposals. Those came to Council last month um, in May, and, and we're now well on the way to um, implementing and recruiting the new management structure. Um, in terms of challenges, um, they are, there is a consistency in the challenges across the service. The, the financial situation and the financial projections and financial stability dominate the, the challenges. Um, we will be bringing forward to the Council later this month um, a, a revised an update on the financial strategy and, and the projections and progress towards delivering financial sustainability. We are continuing to work to get the benefits from procurement, and I suppose that is not just financial savings, but it is um, um, social, social benefit clauses um, we will be working as part of the new battle construction and meet the buyer events, etc., hosted by the, 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 the main contractors and Hubco to really bring the full benefits of procurement to, to the county. Um, we continue to work on engaging with and investing in our staff um, through, through people strategy, leadership development. Um, and a key part going forward, in the, which the SLG met and discussed further this morning, is, is, is clear um, um, workforce strategies um, to make sure that our workforce is the workforce that we need to deliver the services going forward, whether it is the changes that come through integrated health and social care or, or just the wider changes that, that, that we will see over the, the coming years. Um, and, and all of that, I suppose, I'm very specifically around my service, the the significant changes that are brought around with the move from finance and HR to finance and integrated service support, um, the embedding of the management team, and then moving to look at the rest of our staffing structures and our business processes to, to ensure that we continue to deliver the services that are required to our internal and external customers and to do that in the most cost-effective and efficient way that we can. Um, that is a very broad overview, picking out some of the key, key points, Chair. I am happy to pause there and take any questions the committee may have. Thanks, Gary. Questions, comments? Ian. Yeah, thank you, uh, Derek. Uh, I would like to ask, do we have any staff in the Council who are on zero-hour contracts? Um, my understanding, I do not have the facts, figures in front of me, but my understanding is that we do use some areas of the business where there are zero hours contracts. We have tried to, to minimise those. And they were particularly prevalent in sport and leisure around um, sports instructors as part of the changes that we implemented. Um, during 13-14, we moved many more of those staff on to um, contracts with, with, with um, regularised hours. And so I think if there's a management team, there are parts of the organisation where, where, where they are used, but we would see, we'd endeavour to be, to be minimising their use where, where, where at all possible. We have a number of staff who will employ on, on more casual contracts where we can't, you know, um, where, where it provides flexibility in the workforce to deliver service to cover um, peaks in demand or, or absences, etc. So we would we, we prefer to, to use staff on a, on a more casual contract arrangement than a zero-hours contract. Ian? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks. That, that's um, useful to know. Um, a second question on switch uh, programme is what opportunities are there for retraining uh, for people on switch? If somebody is sitting in switch and find that there's no suitable role for them in the organisation, but they would like to be trained to, uh, in different sk skill set, for instance. Uh, what kind of opportunities are there? Um, 
certainly as, as staff who are displaced uh, and sit within switch then at the heart of that is to provide um, training opportunities um, so for example um, I know for example this week we've probably got staff who are being put through project management training um, to support their either being able to utilize their skills um, elsewhere in the organization or indeed um, to, to support the, 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 the success and find an alternative employment so yeah it is very much at the heart of that whether it's on the job training etc we also have within the our HR policies um, a training and development scheme which we can utilize so as well as staff getting the support within switch uh, they can move into roles as trainee or development roles um, um, and I have the support there too Brian, firstly, Ian, uh, then Jim, sorry. <coughs> First, firstly, on the, uh, the Meet the Buyer event, uh, I, was, I was at uh, one of these and, and found it uh, very, very informative and, uh, to, to meet Morrison Construction uh, on the, on the, at, the, at the library uh, was, was uh, you know, the, se the senior uh, officer uh, of uh, Morrison's. It was, it was very beneficial, you know, and uh, they were telling me about the, the number of uh, 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 small businesses that have been uh, uh, contacting them uh, for uh, uh, possible uh, engagement uh, during, during the, the construction period. But it was, there was also uh, many people there from the, uh, our people there from employment services and job creation kind of agendas trying to pick up on people who are wanting a, a job or a, or, a, or a development. But I don't think it was really sort of publicised that way as a, as a recruitment fair. You know, it was more, uh, it was publicised as a meet the buyer event. So a, lot of, so a lot of the targeted audience was, 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 was business people, you know, uh, to, to actually uh, meet the buyer. But I, th I think that the benefits of having employment services there as well was, 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 was very good, you know, on, on our, our behalf. Uh, but maybe we should do a bit more, you know, <coughs> on the, uh, the job creation uh, side uh, for, for, the, for the local economy, uh, for the local uh, labour force, you know, to get them uh, some more of these positive destinations uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, figures as well. Um, on the, my futures uh, uh, scheme, um, obviously we're, we're, we're looking at uh, this all the time and we're, we're seeing the, the numbers and the, and the throughput. But I'm just looking for a bit more sort of benchmarking on this. See? Um, and I don't know how you're going to be doing the benchmarking, but when, when you start thinking the five, five people out of 33 have taken voluntary service, the severance, sorry, but why, why, did, why did they take voluntary severance it would be my first question. Yeah? Um, was it uh, the induced rates that was there? Was there not a, a suitable alternative uh, job for them? Uh, and why was there not a suitable alternative job to them? You know, uh, this, this kind of uh, benchmarking uh, statistics, and, uh, and obviously there, there can be some kind of financial figures in there. You know, what, what's uh, without giving away anybody's personal details, but uh, there could be some kind of uh, benchmarking figures at how much the voluntary servants uh, is, is uh, part of this is costing. And, uh, the, the number of employees at 33, there's no dates on this, you know, uh, from May till when, you know, you know is, is, is a number still coming into my future? And maybe even sort of, sort of a monthly breakdown, you know, kind of on the uh, benchmark. And I don't know how you propose it or a quarterly break, breakdown, but maybe some kind of uh, quartile uh, kind of figures uh, on this uh, in the, in the, in the uh, and maybe in, pre in, in uh, next reports. Eh? Thanks. Yeah, happy to expand um, in terms of the, the, the statistics of, of staff who, who are displaced and move into switch and, and how successful the program is and in, 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 in moving them on through the various, various routes open. Um, we will bring back, uh, as we see, the, 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 the 2014 seven scheme will bring that back through both the impact, you'll see the impact through the financial strategy and also through the financial monitoring reports um, in terms of the, the finances of it but certainly um, um, yeah, I would agree there's, there's um, opportunities to bring back to committee um, the information that, that you've talked about yeah, there's, there's, there's many reports on the, the overall uh, effects you know the, uh, overlaps into many other uh, savings within the, within the council but I just wondered about, uh, actually sort of, uh, some kind of individual report on, on, the, on the, the My Futures programme, you know, just to sort of try and ring fence it without taking the, uh, uh, duplicating, you know, from other budgets. Well, very much the, the, there will always be that duplication. The My Future programme is around flexibility in our workforce, about 
the challenge of reducing our workforce and therefore delivering savings which are accounted for in, in the financial strategy. But I'm happy through the, the, the quarterly performance reports to expand the information that members receive on the, the, the actual numbers that, that we're seeing. Jim. Thanks. My, my main question has sort of been covered by, by your commitment to provide additional information. I, mean, I was, I was uh, more concentrating on the six, you know, we've got 33 people who have been through switch, 16 of them are on placements. It was just to get a feel for the kind of placements we're talking about, you know, um, is it uh, short term sort of goals, is it, is it, you know, jobs that are set up to achieve certain objectives over a period of time kind of thing. Um, what obviously would be a concern if people and, and are, are, are put into switch as a result of, sort of cost saving measures to be ending up somewhere that they're just parked basically. Um, I'd like to some more information as to the productiveness of these placements if you like. Um, but I suppose that will be covered in terms of the, the Gary's commitment to provide additional kind of breakdowns on that. Um, and, and I did, did just try to get a handle on, you know, we're, we're talking about the current position in, in this. Is it, are we talking about the current position in April or are we talking about the current position now? The only other question I had was the purchase to pay uh, successfully went live in November. I, I've maybe missed this, but what's purchase to pay? So, so first of all, just, yeah, the, the figures in terms of my future are those for the, at the end of the year. Um, and it's very, very, as I appreciate, very dynamic. Um, uh, changing, changing all the time, so um, we'll, we'll make sure we reference in the, the future reports as well exactly the, the point when we've, we've taken the snapshot for you. Um, in terms of, of purchase to pay, really it's a, a transformational shift in the way we enable our staff, um, our teachers to, to buy the goods and the services that they need to deliver. Um, so we've, we've rolled it out um, within sport and leisure, and we're in the process of rolling it out within schools. And it's very much moving from a, what I would describe as a, 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 a historic way of buying things to, to something which is much more akin to, um, much easier, much more akin to buy things off Amazon or whatever, you know, online catalogues, electronic processing of the orders, um, much slicker process around paying the supplier, and we'll see that make it easier for staff on the ground to, to buy the right goods and services, buying them on contract and making sure we're getting the best price, a much um, more cost-effective transaction process to, to, to do that, um, and prompter payment of the supplier, so the performance starts around payment of invoices to local suppliers and national suppliers being, being improved as well. Right, so so I, I paid a visit to um, Midfield House a couple of years ago, um, and that, one of the things we were talking about was one of the rooms not having curtains in it because they'd been damaged and the amount of time it took them to go through a process of being able to buy them, whereas they could have went up the road to you know, one of the furniture shops and just bought a, a set probably cheaper than we were getting it. Is it that kind of thing you're talking about? Very much so. That, that's the feedback we got in schools. You know, we, the, the, the systems and the processes we used to have made it hard for people to do their job. It's now much easier, so, you know. Okay, any other questions for Gary? Okay, Gary, thank you. John, you're the last performer of the day, please. Uh, I'm on a... Thanks, Chair. One of the, well, I've got two disadvantages today of standing for Gary Sherrett and also going last, so a number of the points I was going to make have been covered by previous presenters. In terms of the major challenges are set on page 93. The new buyer's crescent issue is focusing a significant amount of attention and will be reported to a special council meeting in June. So I'll start off with the factual position there. In terms of going forward within the operational stuff, phase two housing has been reported to this committee. Fees and charges, the corporate working group have concluded their work and there will be a report going forward to June Council and also in reference to June Council there will be a progress report stage one on New Battle High School that will be coming forward in the next few weeks. 
In terms of the detail of property and facilities management, there's information within the reports, and Gary's gave me some notes, so I would be endeavouring to ask any questions or clarifications members may have. Chair, I apologise, that's a quick run through, but I feel a lot of things have been covered earlier on the agenda. Yeah. Questions or comments for John? Keeping probably the stance of stuff in there uh, as a new buyer's problem, and there's going to be a special meeting for that, and we're aware that local members are, are, are regularly being briefed and debating with officers the way forward, and we have had several meetings regarding this issue as well. Is there any questions at all for John on this issue? Or any other issues in the paper? Okay, can thank you very much and thank you. See you back here at two o'clock for all that can attend.